Welcome to the What If It's Not Depression podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Achina Stein. Today, I'm interviewing Robert Rakowski, also known as Dr. Bob. He's a chiropractor, board-certified kinesiologist, certified clinical nutritionist, certified biological terrain instructor. I'd love to know more about that. And the clinical director of the Natural Medicine Center in Houston, Texas. In addition to running a busy private practice, Dr. Bob has lectured internationally for over 30 years on various topics related to natural and lifestyle medicine, happiness, and success. He has appeared on numerous television programs and international radio talk shows. He is a recognized expert in functional endocrinology and in-office diagnostic procedures to assess nutrition status, and his clinical experience ranges from treating elite professional athletes to critically ill patients with a variety of cancers and autoimmune diseases. I asked him to come on to this show or this episode because I was particularly interested in his knowledge about mushrooms and how to use mushrooms to help with mental health issues. But we're going to cover a whole bunch of things in this episode. Welcome, Dr. Bob. Oh, and before we go on, if you like this episode, please click the like button and subscribe. Well, happy, 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 beautiful, amazing day. That's my standard hello. Uh, I like to triple up the happy because, you know, it's super duper important and I'm honored. I'm excited to chat with you today and, and your guests. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I know you've been doing this for a long time, but it's always helpful to talk about what brought you to this arena of medicine uh, it, because I think it's important for people to see why they become passionate about these things. People in my field who, who turn into functional medicine are usually um, brought to alternative uh, areas of healthcare because of experiences that they've had in their own life, uh, health-wise, or a close family member. What was it for you? Well, it was a near-death experience, you know, and, and fortunately, it wasn't that close, but uh, when I was in college the first time, my first degree is electrical engineering, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, I'll take a step back. My dad always said, son, you should become a doctor, and I said, <laughs> well, dad, why would I do that? I never had a visit to a doctor that I enjoyed, you know, the doctor was nice, but the visit, not so fun. I, I'd rather be a part of something that was enjoyable to everybody. But with that said, I got hurt playing football, went to the medical doctor. He gave me muscle relaxers, painkillers, put my neck in a brace, my arm in a sling. And, you know, basically said, you know, all right, let's just see what happens. Come back in a few weeks. Well, I didn't read the bottle. I wasn't used to taking pills. If I would have read it, it said, don't mix with alcohol, don't operate heavy machinery. I went out on a date had one drink and fell asleep behind the wheel of my vehicle at 55 miles an hour, really passed out. Wow. So very fortunately, my date grabbed me, shook me. Uh, you know, I woke up, pulled over to the side. She said, what happened? I said, I have no idea. And she said, well, I'm driving home. I said, good idea. <laughs> yeah. Got home, picked up the pills. It said, you know, don't mix with alcohol. Don't operate heavy machinery. Right. Thought, oh my gosh, this almost killed me. Got rid of it and said, all right, let's do something different. And that's how I found functional medicine. And once I found it, I've never looked back. You know, I started thinking right away, wow, there is a natural way to help the body. And I like this. And by the way, that was a visit to a doctor that I really enjoyed. Right, right, great. No, that's that's great, yeah. So, you know, we're, it sounds to me that you have had uh, quite a bit of experience using natural uh, medicines for all sorts of issues. But today I would love to really focus on brain health and mental health. And, you know, so can you start there where, uh, you know, what the link is between brain health and mental health? I'm going to go to Dan Am Daniel Amen, you know, board certified psychiatrist has a phenomenal TED talk entitled what I learned after 83,000 brain scans. Right. He said something fascinating. He said, you know, up until very recently, psychiatrists were the only medical professionals that didn't evaluate the organ that they were treating. But <laughs> brain scans changed that. And then he wrote a book called The End of Mental Illness. And he asked the question, what if brain health and mental health are very tightly related? And he makes a good argument that they are. And that's been my clinical experience as well. If you create a healthy brain, you're a lot more likely to have a healthy mind, but let's keep the two separate. The mind and the brain are separate. Hmm. 
Okay. So, and when he says they are separate, um, does he still mean that they should be treated separately? Not the mind and the brain separately, but understand that the brain is the focusing mechanism of the mind. But our mind, he would call it the, the universe's or God's greatest creation. And it certainly runs the show. But keep in mind, you know, we look at the brain and, and you know, I've heard it said Albert Einstein's brain is, you know, in a jar somewhere in New Jersey. <laughs> but keep in mind, his mind isn't there anymore, right? So the two are separate. And you might ask the question, does contributions of his mind live forever? And it really does. You know, you, you can create ideas and changes to the universe. And ultimately, our goal is to master that mind in a way that it serves us and the world better. And creating a healthy brain helps us to do that. So tell me then, what are some things that can affect brain health and mental health concurrently? Are there, are there different things that, um, are they, uh, would you say they were one and the same or completely separate? They're integrated. They're, you know, nicely coupled, but they are separate, even though they function together. So, mm -hmm. you know, we could start with the very, very basics. The brain mm -hmm. is the most hydrated tissue in the body, estimated to be about 70 of water. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we know is that even 1% of dehydration mm -hmm. can affect cognition. So tell us, what are some of the factors or the underlying root causes that affect brain health and mental health? You know, it comes down to lifestyle choices. And, and for decades, I've described them as the magnificent seven. Mm -hmm. I teach people that you need to eat right, drink right, think right, move right, sleep right, poop right, talk right. Every single day, poop right usually gets chuckles and that's detoxify right. Uh, and you know what, when we do these things right, we're gonna be okay. But any one of these factors, eating wrong, drinking wrong, certainly thinking wrong, moving wrong, sleeping wrong, not detoxifying correctly, uh, talking wrong, all these things can have a negative impact on both the brain and the mind. Right. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And I think the way you're talking about it, it's really important to have habits in place. And it's not about sort of treating something as if, you know, it's a one-time deal and then you're set, you know, you really have to change habits. And what you said was a key word daily, right? Daily doing these things. And that's really hard. Don't you find that to be the case? Well, it is for a lot of people, I believe, until they make it a priority. You know, it's been said that we make changes based on inspiration or desperation. I'd love for everybody to be inspired to be their best self all the time. But reality is most people to make changes when they absolutely have to. So they have some type of crisis or or maybe a family member does, and they say, okay, time for me to start living healthy. And when they do, their mind, body, and spirit all benefit. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, and then, you know, you mentioned uh, food for sure, food and drink, getting those things right. And I find food, um, uh, stress, and toxins absolutely need to be uh, dealt with as well. Um, and and uh, the thing that can really uh, affect depression, particularly because our, this episode is about what if it's not depression, but depressive like symptoms is food or lack of the right foods. So I, and so we, I always talk about optimizing brain nutrition. What's your experience and what is it that you do to optimize brain nutrition? Well, let's just say first and foremost, it's critical. And I, I tell people the brain is the most nutrient dependent, energy dependent, stress vulnerable, toxin vulnerable system in the body. So you're, you're right on with that. Mm -hmm. And we also know that malnutrition is the number one cause of death on the planet and has been for decades. We've depleted soil and I'll tell the backstory and then I'll go into optimizing the brain, but sure. farmers, maybe a hundred years ago or scientists found out that they could grow big plants with only three elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, the top fertilizer in the world. But it takes 30 elements to create healthy plants, animals, and humans and now we go and for the last 60 years hard, we've been depleting the soil, pulling essentially deficient plants out and trying to nourish the population with it. And we have a global malnutrition challenge. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell a little bit of a story about how I optimize nutrition. I was lecturing in Orlando, Florida in, in about the year 2002 and PhD researcher Barry Sears was presenting his book called The Zone. 
uh, and he put up a copy of the USDA food pyramid, the guidelines. And he said, if ever there was a terrorist-like plot designed to destroy the health of the world, this would be it. Uh, and you know, he showed it and I, and I looked at that and I thought, you know what, he's right. So I created my own nutrition pyramid. The base of the pyramid is food. If God made it, it's okay. If man made it, stay away. Then we go to superfoods and that could blend to our medicinal mushroom discussion. Right. Then functional foods. There's functional foods for the brain, for the gut, for inflammatory process, for detoxification. Then we go with a good multivitamin, multimineral, probiotics. And by the way, there's more brain chemistry in our gut than in our brain. Uh, omega-3s, which the brain has a super high concentration, and then finally a combination of D3K2, and those are the seven rungs of my nutrition pyramid. And for every patient, we're gonna complete every rung in a way that honors their body, their genetics, and their goals. Right, right. Can you talk more about what functional foods are? Because I'm sure people hear the, that term and they don't really understand what you mean by that. I was very surprised that there are tens of thousands of medical studies on functional foods. So mm -hmm. these are foods that are essentially fortified in a way to have a proven health benefit. And beyond functional foods are medical foods and medical foods, guaranteed potency, guaranteed purity, proven effectiveness in human clinical trial with every nutrient recognized as safe. These are things that I, I recommend for everybody. But there are certain conditions, for instance, there used to be a detoxification medical food. And then the FDA said, well, toxicity is not a medical condition. Therefore, we're not going to allow the distinction medical food, but functional food. But let's just say it's, it's a food that has a proven health benefit, clean, safe, effective, low allergy potential, you know, really, really good sources of nutrition for the majority of people. And so can you give some examples of a functional foods? Are these products that you're talking about or are they actual foods? Well, they're products. And, and, mm -hmm. and so, you know, probably one that's well known is, is one of the worst out there and that's Ensure. Yes. You know, medicine uses it for weight gain and it's, you know, loaded with stuff that I wouldn't recommend for anybody, right. but yet right. it still falls into that distinction. You know, I have lectured for professional nutraceutical companies and the top companies, they tend to have these powder mixes that are in the category of functional food. Right, right. So you're not including things like protein shakes in, uh, in uh, that category of functional foods. Well, not in and of itself, but a, a good quality protein shake could be a functional food but not all protein shakes are going to be functional foods. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I think it's important for people to understand the, the differences that, that there is a specific purpose to create a, uh, a specific change within the body as opposed to just providing nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think I, I, I you know, never had an opportunity to explain people to people about what a functional food is. And I think you did a really great job with that. Yeah. So, and I know toxins is a, is also a big impact on the brain and that in toxins in itself can induce depression. What are some toxins that you know of that can cause depression or other mental health issues? Oh boy. Now we've just opened Pandora's box because there are <laughs> over 80,000 registered toxic chemicals in the environment. If we start even in utero, now they're knowing that in utero toxin exposure is associated with a significant increased risk of autism. Uh, and when we start looking at these toxins, one category that I'm gonna call out are xenoestrogens and xeno spelled with an X, X-E-N-O. Right. There's estrogens in plastics, estrogens in pesticides, estrogens injected in animals. And here's what we know, when the estrogens are elevated, they actually increase a protein in the blood called thyroid hormone binding globulin. And as you bind up thyroid hormone, guess what? That's less energy for the brain, but it's also a slower metabolism. And we know as people gain weight, especially if they, as they gain fat or worse yet, visceral fat, their risk of depression goes up. They recycle their stress hormones, they become more inflamed. So by definition, a toxin is a poison. It's something that disrupts structure and or function. And we all do better to stay away from it. And our brain, unfortunately, is profoundly intoxicated. The xenoestrogens, the, the heavy metals, those are some of the things that are, are causing the biggest challenges. Mercury gets a lot of press for being you know, uh, a, a neurotoxin, but aluminum, the most abundant neurotoxin on the planet. 
Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. It's important to uh, really do a good evaluation of that. And I find that a lot of conventional or traditional doctors, it's not even on their radar, unfortunately. Uh, not even the heavy metals that we know of, except for maybe young children, you know, who are being seen by their pediatrician. And uh, it's, again, it begs the question, you have to have an index of suspicion to consider heavy metals as or other toxic toxicities. Um, but to even the environmental types of toxins that you just mentioned, it's not even close to the radar like some of the heavy metals are, right? So, I mean, I'm glad you're bringing all of this up. So what do you do if you are aware that someone has had exposures to all of these toxins? Uh, are there any strategies that you uh, put in place for your patients? Well, absolutely. Number one rule of toxicology is to separate yourself from the toxic source. So if we can get people to get a cleaner environment, you know, a lot of times we'll have people detoxify their pantry or their kitchen, get rid of the processed food, get rid of the genetically modified stuff, get rid of all these uh, preservatives and things like that. But we can branch to functional foods and even medicinal mushrooms, because when we start talking about heavy metals, the top medicinal mushroom is called Ganoderma lucidum, also known as reishi. And a fairly recent study within the last two years shows that in the body, reishi increases by about 800% a protein the body makes called metallothionine proteins. Mm. Uh, and these are proteins that clear out heavy metals and beautifully it'll even cross the blood brain barrier uh, and clear it from our most vulnerable tissue. And then there are functional foods that are designed for heavy metal clearance. And then there are certain botanicals. Garlic is pretty well known, cilantro, corella, calcium, right. vitamin C. These are things that can clear heavy metals. Uh, and people, if they stop putting them in and are diligent about pulling them out, they can have profound changes in their wellness. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, there are certain foods that people need to remember to manage in terms of how much they eat, especially if you're pregnant, like tuna, because it can be quite high in mercury. So, uh, and I think the average person uh, in, the, in the population knows, that, at least in our country, maybe not other countries, but, um, but I, I wonder if you can talk about other foods that people should be aware of, specific foods, in order to avoid heavy metals or be careful with if they're, you know, if they want to limit their heavy metal exposure. Do you know of any? Well, you, you made a very good point. When we start talking near the top of the food chain, the bioconcentrators, and, and by the way, humans are at the top, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll take a tangent on that, even away from food. And, and, and I'll do that right now because the modern skeleton is, is known to have 500 to 1000 times the lead of pre-industrialized humans. Mm. So ultimately our air, our water and our food, but it's known that as you eat things higher on the food chain, and, and so we'd be talking about animal protein, the good news is they bioconcentrate the nutrients and some references say to a factor of 10,000, but they also bioconcentrate the toxins right. as high as a factor of 10,000. Uh, and, and so when you stay with more plants, and, and that's one of my favorite statements on nutrition, Michael Pollan was famous for saying this, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, the deep water fish, especially those that are the bioconcentrators, those are the biggest, but really anything near the top of the food chain is gonna bioconcentrate things more effectively. Uh, and my guideline is if God made it, it's okay. If man made it, stay away. So get away from the processed foods. Those are problematic in so many ways. Absolutely, absolutely. But I think it's also important to emphasize that making sure that the source, you know, God made a cow, right? God made a pig, but the way we've treated them, unfortunately, um, causes some cows and pigs and chickens, you know, to not be the healthiest sources. Um, so it's looking at grass fed and uh, cows and pasture raised chickens as the source. Uh, it's really important to, to do that so that you are getting these animals who aren't fed all these toxins, right? In their feed, They're, and the only way to know is to really go to the farm and ask, what do they feed their, how do they treat their animals? What do they feed them, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that would be phenomenal for all of humanity if we all took those steps. And, and while we're on that for a moment, 83% of antibiotics in the U.S. are used in livestock. 
Uh, and they're fed a very inappropriate diet. A lot of them are fed corn. That's not natural. They have an extreme inflammatory process. The antibiotics are designed to keep them from getting sick. But then all of this commercial meat, egg, milk is loaded with antibiotics. The word anti against bios life. We swallow those. It disrupts our microbiome. Powerful link between that and brain chemistry and anxiety, depression, happiness, if it's, if it's a good microbiome. Right. You know, and I find that a lot of people look at that information and, you know, for good reason, make changes in their diet to become vegetarian or vegan. But I find that when they make those changes, it's actually not the best thing to do for your brain. And so I try to encourage people to actually continue to eat meat and, uh, and uh, eat eggs in particular, because they're high sources of fat and protein, uh, that the body, especially if you uh, come from a heritage that has eaten meat for generations on end, that it's really hard for your microbiome to extract, uh, extract all those nutrients from vegetables <laughs> as, as efficiently as they would be from meat and other sources of protein that they're, that they used to eat. So I, you know, I encourage them to find healthy sources of meat as opposed to um, you know, just cutting it out altogether. I totally agree that the way some of these animals are treated uh, is really, really bad, but that shouldn't be the reason to not eat meat. I think you can really treat an animal in a sacred way and thank them for providing you nutrition, right? Well, that's, that's very well said. And, and by the way, when I teach nutrition, which I've done for over 30 years, I let people know we're omnivores. You know, we have canines for cutting. We have molars for grinding. Our digestive tract is, is not that of a carnivore or an herbivore. It's, it's in between. It's a, an omnivore. And so we honor ourselves by eating food, not too much, mostly, but not right. exclusively plants. Exactly. That's absolutely right. Mostly plants. But, you know, sometimes I get this argument. Well, you know, people in India are vegetarians. There's lots of people who are vegetarians. And that's true. But they are vegetarians for generations, <laughs> generation after generation after generation. So their microbiome has gotten really good at extracting all these nutrients from the foods that they're eating. But the other thing is, is that they're probably eating high source of really good sources of protein and fats that you don't even realize, you know, so, um, and you, you might not even know, uh, you know, what their diet is like, you think that they're just eating vegetables, but that's not really the case. And so I think it's important, you know, the example that I give is that if you have, um, if you have all of these workers, factory workers, um, putting together Fords, right, in, in America, right, and they do a great job of putting these cars really efficient and putting these cars together. If you took that entire force and moved them, moved them to Japan and said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> you know what to do, right? <laughs> so, you know, of course they don't know what to do. They'll try, they might do their best, but they don't really do a, a very good job because you haven't even given them the chance if you just immediately switch diets. So, you know, I think it's really important for people to, to know what they're getting into when they are changing their diet for ethical reasons that it may not be the best thing for their body, but over and over and over again, I've seen so many people, sick people come to my practice because, and when you, when I put their history on a timeline, it's like, oh, I became a vegan <laughs> or I became a vegetarian at this point. And then, you know, like a year later or even two years later, they just crashed. So, and, you know, really bringing those sources of protein, even if they choose to uh, remain in that diet to really start putting in, taking out the carbs, <laughs> putting in lots of vegetables, adding a lot of fats and proteins, and then they can get their brain back essentially. Oh, and, and that's really the key, isn't it? You know, if you look at the brain being the number one structural component being fat and that fat being DHA, docosohexanoic acid, they can get a little bit of that in cold weather plants, but the source is really cold water fish and, and, and cold weather meats. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm sure, you know, by me saying what I just said is going to create a little uh, upset, but I think it's really important to put it out there and get people to think about it and have a conversation. So, so let's dive in into the mushrooms because that's what I really wanted to, us to talk about and, and, and mushrooms specifically for depressive like symptoms or nervousness, anxiety. Um, can you just tell us what you, what you know about what's out there and how you, what your experience has been and impact in mental health issues particularly? Well, let, let's go back to, you know, the world is really recognizing this. Medicinal mushrooms are a $50 billion a year market, and, and they do so many different things. So the mushroom that I particularly like, and then we can, we can spin off of there, is called Ganoderma lucidum, also known as reishi. It's known as the king of herbs. Uh, and probably the world's greatest mycologist is a guy named Paul Stamets. You know, I read a book by him years ago entitled Medical Mycology, and he looked at all the benefits of these amazing mushrooms, mm -hmm. but his own story as a teen, he had a horrific stutter. Uh, and he says, you know what? I, I wasn't comfortable asking questions in, in class. I wasn't comfortable talking to girls. Uh, and then one day he had an experience with medicinal mushrooms and just like that, his stutter went away. Uh, and so he's dedicated, who knows, 50, 60 years to the study of it. And when you start looking at it, and we'll go with, with Ganoderma, because that's the one I know best, it has all the fabulous 50, all the vitamins, minerals, amino acids, proteins, carbohydrates, fat, fiber, and water in doses that make a difference to human health. 430 unique molecules, 79 of which are antimicrobial. A number of studies on this and the brain, and it's proven to enhance serotonin for happiness. Mm -hmm. Dopamine depends on what part of the brain we're talking about. It could be focus. It could be extreme joy. It could be fine motor control. It enhances acetylcholine for memory and it enhances GABA for calm. It also induces neural stem cells. It can dissolve amyloid plaque. It can kill off brain viruses. So it's very powerful in that respect. And then there's a number of other mushrooms that are also powerful, you know, lion's mane, cordyceps, turkey tail, those are some that are, are pretty popular with proven brain and central nervous system benefits. Excellent, excellent. So uh, when is, is it best to uh, provide uh, a, a complement of these together or to start with one mushroom at a time? That's gonna be preference. You know, if, if you could start with the king, which I do, the king of herbs, Ganon or Velucidum, mm -hmm. you know, I've used that in clinical practice all 31 years. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew it was very, very powerful. And, you know, in terms of functional foods and functional coffees, that's really where, where my use of these mushrooms expanded because there's functional coffees infused with medicinal mushrooms. Uh, and, you know, my favorite is infused with Ganoderma lucidum. There's other companies that'll infuse a number of different mushrooms. But when you put it in coffee and people do it every single day, they never need to be reminded. They never plan to quit. And they nourish their brain and body in a beautiful way with their daily habit. Right, uh, right. Kind of goes back to your original statement. You know, if people make a habit of it then they're going to be better, you know, uh, forever, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, many times I, you know, I get back like a lot of information about mushrooms. I've read some things and there are some sources that say that if you have candida or allergies to mold or sensitivities to mold, that you shouldn't have mushrooms. Uh, you know, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, maybe some. Uh, and so then when you start looking again at my favorite reishi, it actually is proven anti-yeast, anti-fungus, anti-parasite. It can dissolve the candida biofilms that can make it very, very difficult to get after it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so ultimately, you've got to look at it very, very differently. People might even ask about an, al an allergy. You know, so what do you do about people that have mushroom allergies? Right. And I'll use the analogy of milk. You know, someone will say, I'm allergic to milk. And I'll ask them, well, are you allergic to Human milk, cow milk, goat's milk, camel milk, killer whale milk. Right, and right. Say, well, gosh, cow's milk. Well, how about sheep's milk or human milk? No, those are fine. Mm -hmm. Well, same with mushrooms. If someone's uh, allergic to a you know, food mushroom like shiitake, well, are they going to be allergic to a medicinal mushroom? Completely different protein content, and it's highly unlikely. But proceed with caution. You know, have a little bit. If you're really sensitive, you, know, you probably carry an EpiPen, 
Uh, but I, I personally haven't seen anybody that's been allergic to the medicinal mushrooms that I use, but I'm open to the idea that it's a possibility. Are there any mushrooms that can make candida worse? Probably the food-based. Mm -hmm. You know, again, when we go with the medicinals that have the antimicrobials within it, anything that has a little bit more of a starch content could be problematic. And then we would go with food grade again, but mushrooms generally are low glycemic index. So it would probably be for most candida patients, a very acceptable food. We just try to get them to stay away from starches and sugars. You know, mushrooms are, are in a category all by themselves and they have a really good blend of, of protein and carbohydrate and generally a very low glycemic index. Okay, and do all mushrooms uh, af affect uh, mental health issues? Uh, do they improve or there's, are there specific ones just like the ones you mentioned? Well, the, you know, I would make the argument that everything we do affects mental health. If you get a mushroom <laughs> that's a complete protein and a good source of nutrients, it's probably going to have a little bit of a benefit. But when I mentioned specifically about Ganoderma, you know, there's nearly a hundred published medical studies on its benefits for the brain. Uh, and so that one's very, very well known. Would the others have benefit? Probably. They just haven't been as studied as extensively. So if someone were to take any mushrooms, what would they have to uh, be careful about? Uh, or, you know, be worried about if they, as possible side effects. What, what I like to tell people is mm -hmm. that whenever you have something that's a powerful antimicrobial, there could be a die-off reaction, what we call a Hersheimer reaction. Right. Uh, and, but I also tell people, since these mushrooms are very powerful at promoting detoxification, the published symptoms of chronic poisoning include fatigue, sleep disturbance, intestinal distress, allergy symptoms, headaches, confusion, and anxiety. And those things can happen if a detox is promoted. More commonly, it would be some type of GI distress, maybe a little urgency. And I let people know, as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. We want to get that stuff out of the body. A headache, well, hydrate a little more, take it a little easy, maybe back off you know, the frequency or the intensity of the dose, but this too shall pass. You know, When people go through a detox, if they tough it out and get on the other side of it, they generally feel a whole lot better afterwards. So it's basically a similar reaction to if you were taking some type of antifungal. Similar exactly. if you, yeah, it, whether it be Nystatin or uh, Diflucan or herbs like powdarko and uh, garlic. And, you know, there's a whole, whole bunch of different uh, herbs that you can take to help with candida. So it's a similar type of reaction. Um, yeah, that's, that's really good to know. Uh, so that's interesting so that it wouldn't necessarily cause a candida problem, but it can actually, or exacerbate a candida problem, but actually treat it. Yeah, and that's what the medical literature shows, even mm -hmm. about the biofilm. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a nice choice. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, when, when people are going to use a powerful antifungal, they may have an extreme case. And you look at that molecule like nystatin, all it does is kill the fungus. It doesn't provide any buffers for right. the detox. But the medicinal mushrooms, there's nutritive buffers, alkalizing buffers, anti-inflammatory buffers, and they're great for the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, the bowel, the skin. So in many ways, it's uh, a more gentle choice, even though it can be as effective. Mm -hmm. So um, if someone wanted to, and, and I want to tell the audience that it's really important to get a <laughs> uh, medical provider to work with who understands the use of mushrooms. But if someone wanted to work with someone and uh, start taking mushrooms, uh, is, are there, is there a place to start or a way to start that? Well, quality, you know, and I, and I tell people that if you're going to get a medicinal mushroom, why not get something that's USDA certified organic processed in a GMP facility, if people know what that is, just in really good manufacturing. And here's what we know. They've done animal studies. And again, I'll go with Ganoderma, no known toxicity, no known drug interaction. And they've taken, you know, 100 pound dogs and directly in their bloodstream infused the equivalent of 4,000 doses a day, weeks on end, without creating toxic response. So they are wonderfully safe. But with that said, when you have the right team, the right partner, the right coach, the right doctor, instead of just 
feeling your way along, you can get some of an experience that can really move you to your best health fastest and most efficiently. Yeah. It sounds like just even adding a, a low dose and in some fashion, the way you talked about having it in your coffee is, is probably the best way to go so that you're not causing a Herxheimer's reaction, right? Have you ever heard of anyone having a Herxheimer's reaction just by putting it in coffee? <laughs> Well, I have, but but keep <laughs> keep in mind, you know, I'm I'm an investor in a in a company that puts Ganoderma in coffee, so I, I'm I'm aware of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people that have done it, and there have been a few. Mm. Uh, so it's possible; it certainly is. Yeah, well, that's good to know. So it's important to to be aware of that possibility. Absolutely, yeah. It, and I wonder if it, if it is because of I have always wondered if it's because of candida on some level, or if it's just because the antifungals kind of work the same way uh, as mushrooms, because there's so, there's so much overlap with those two classes uh, or species, <laughs> you know, so to speak. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to discuss these things. It, it is a, uh, a topic that is kind of out there elusive for a lot of people and sort of bringing it home and, and connecting it to mental health is I think really important, especially now because it is becoming more and more popular um, and I'm getting a lot of questions. It's something that I want to educate myself more. So you have put a fire under my bottom to do that. <laughs> So, well, so we talked a lot uh, about food and stress and toxins. And is there anything else uh, besides mushrooms that you would like to add or anything else about mushrooms that you think we should know that I haven't asked you? Well, you know, it's a trend that the world is really catching on to and for very good reason. And, and I'll take a little tangent here. Paul Stamets, the world authority, after 9-11, you know, he was hired by the CIA to try to come up with things that would be anti-anthrax or anti-bioterrorism. Uh, and here's what he found, the medicinal mushrooms have those properties. And, and we can go back to Ganoderma reishi. You can go to PubMed, it blocks replication of the HIV virus. Uh, it can eradicate herpes, HPV, H1N1. And we don't name the current virus out there, but there's good PubMed studies showing that it can eradicate that virus as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, nature has the solutions. One point that I often make when having a discussion with people is it's estimated somewhere over 80% of pharmaceuticals were originally derived from natural molecules. So if I can call it God's pharmacy, God's pharmacy has the answer. Sometimes man's pharmacy is a really good choice. It, you know, if they do a good job with it, they can make a, something very effective, cost-effective with minimal side effects, but nature provides. We've got it there and medicinal mushrooms, top superfood on the planet for good reason, safe, effective, and good for the world. Yeah, it is. It is uh, definitely a top superfood for sure. I think it's important at this point that, because it's just popping into my mind, you know, sometimes people see mushrooms uh, out in their backyard. Uh, and it's so, so important to be very, very careful to not eat mushrooms if you don't know what they are, because there are poisonous mushrooms out there. And there's a lot of lookalike mushrooms uh, that you think if you're looking at a book, you think it's that mushroom, but it could be one of those poisons, poisonous ones. So please do not. It happens a couple times every year, you know, in uh, parts of the country where people go on trails and they, you know, they get into eating mushrooms <laughs> and they think, oh, let's just pick these. It's this type, chicken and hens, you know, uh, mushrooms and eating them, you know, uh, part of their meals. And then, and then they end up either dead or, or in the hospital. So be very, very careful eating mushrooms that you pick, you know, out on a trail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thought I'd just add that in there, uh, safety around mushrooms. So, yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Bob. I really appreciate your uh, expertise in this area, as well as everything that you're doing, uh, you know, at your business practice and, uh, and telling us about your knowledge of all these years uh, regarding mental health and your experience. So totally appreciate everything that you've discussed today. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a joy. And you know what? Thank you for making our wonderful world better. I can see you have pure passion and commitment to what you do. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And everyone, just so you know, um, I have a boot camp. It's a 12 week boot camp, and we actually go through all of the different root causes of depression, including stress 
and looking at toxin exposure and certainly food and changing changing your food plan uh, through uh, a dedicated app called Well World App. And it really helps you to narrow down what is the right foods for you and to remove those foods that are causing inflammation and helping your body to detox in a way that's much more uh, natural for you. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.